Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so to, to bring it back and um, finish things up with, with this um, to hopefully get you in a good place to, to work on the project, um, I'm going to go and do the conversion from where is it? From bars to a line chart of circles. Um, along the way, I'll point out the places where the data actually, or you would need to change when you have different data. Um, even though I don't explicitly have different data here. And then I'll talk about um, things like the legend and how to create those. Um, but um, first off, I guess, show of hands, has anyone done part one of the project? All right. Um, yeah, so this isn't actually part one, but it's going to be really helpful for it. Um, since like a good portion of you have gone through that, um, I'll, I'll go maybe a little bit, a little bit quicker through this and then spend more time on things like the axes and the legend and some of the stuff that we haven't talked about yet. Um, oh, yeah, so the reason why you have to use a function is because when you load data externally, you need to pass it some function. Mm -hmm. Are you saying what's the difference between using function draw and doing like var draw equals Oh, yeah, so most, this is something that's strange that it happens, but like most beginner D3 tutorials don't actually load external data. So you don't ever need to use D3.csv, which makes it really frustrating for when newcomers to D3 want to actually visualize real data. Um, and most like tutorials don't, they, I guess, take for granted that this is something that's like just, easy and kind of obvious, but it causes a lot of trouble. Um, so I imagine a lot of the things that you've seen don't need to load external data, but anytime you load external data, you have to use a function because of how d3.csv works. Um, sometimes you actually see it as an anonymous function right here. So if you don't have like a lot of code to do, um, you can just do something like this where you're like, I'm going to create my chart here. And this is the same thing, um, except for we're not naming our function. So in this case, we're defining our function inside of the callback. Um, but this can get a little bit unwieldy if you have a large function to, to draw. Um, so the convention I use, the convention a lot of people use with like larger charts is to name some function, it doesn't have to be draw. Sometimes it's like, I don't know, like make chart or like scatter plot or whatever type of chart you're drawing. And then they put everything um, somewhere before it actually gets called. So notes on, on this. Um, so there's, there's a few conveniences that D3 has to do things that are actually like these somewhat annoying just data things that um, D3 actually does them best in terms of like JavaScript libraries, even though D3 is not like a data library. D3 doesn't do things like um, a lot of heavy manipulation and transformation of actual data itself. So usually that's better handled with like Python or R, but it does have convenience things like converting um, times. So again, everything's a string in 
how D3 loads external data. Sometimes you have a string that's a number and you can just say like plus price and it works. Other times you have complicated things like dates and you have to use this thing that's called time formatting. Um, this is something we will use quite a lot. Um, the reference is um, this long list. This is pretty common across all programming languages. It's this, this standard um, where every time I say like variable has a special percent letter. So if our um, string in this case happens to look like a four digit year, a dash, a two digit month, a dash, and a two digit day. Um, to convert this into an actual JavaScript object, like a date. So there's a difference between a string that encodes a date and an actual date object that we can manipulate with, with our D3. Um, you use a equivalent format string. Um, so this just says um, percent %y is a year that's four digits. The dash is actually just pattern matching. So this does pattern matching for anything that's not preceded with the percent. Um, percent %m is a two-digit month. Percent %d is a two-digit day. Um, so if you do have a different format um, than this, I think mine is, yeah, so mine's different. Mine's just four-digit four year, a dash, and then a two-digit month. Um, you're going to have to change this. Um, so that's potential change number one. Mm -hmm. Yep, so format, like most transformation type things in D3, you call just with, you call as a function with an argument that is your string, like that. Oh, comments in JavaScript, I guess I, I didn't say before, it's just slash slash. Um, the, so the uninteresting things that are chart-like, I'm not actually gonna, gonna talk about things like the margins and the width and the height and actually drawing the axes because it's, it's really standard boilerplate. There isn't a ton of rhyme or reason about it. Everyone kind of does it a little differently. Um, there are some things like Mike Bostock set up some margin conventions, but I just copy all of this boilerplate for any chart I ever do. So whenever I'm sitting down and I'm like, time to do like another chart, I just copy and paste an entire file of something I've done before. And then I just rip out the chart specific code. Um, so margins are, are pretty standard boilerplate. Width and height are a pretty standard boilerplate. Um, and then actually making the SVG is this like really large kind of gross chunk of code here that dynamically creates a uh, SVG, but you can just as well create an SVG as a tag hard coded. Um, the reason I do it here and in, in um, this long function is mainly just to get the margins right. So I set my width to be the width of my chart plus the left and right margin. So I want my SVG to be a little bit bigger and then my chart is going to be within it. Um, and again, Mike Bostock being the benevolent dictator he is with D3 um, made this really good. Uh, so if you want to understand his convention, um, you pretty much just need to look at this chart, um, this graphic. It's basically SVG starts at the top left, and the margin top corresponds to this section. The margin right corresponds to this section. And this black box is actually the SVG, and this gray box is our chart canvas. Um, The specific fields I'm using, I actually have a variable just because 
Um, if I did want to change the neighborhood, I don't necessarily want to have to find every place I use the column name Van Ness. So again, remember the data, every column is named with the neighborhood. So if I actually want to see what Bernal Heights prices look like, I can just change this one variable here, field, to be Bernal Heights. Let's actually just make this uh, something that's variable. So I can just say field plus. Save that. And if we go back to our chart and we refresh it, it is now Bernal Heights median rent. And you can see here, there's a bunch of missing data. So note on visual encodings, um, I guess I kind of skipped over that. Let's talk about visual encodings. Um, so what does the line chart do that is better for this data than the bar chart? So why are we even trying to get a line chart? So it's over time, um, which is the main reason. Uh, time is, again, this unique data type that line charts are actually really well suited to. Um, I will answer with a question, why not use a scatter plot? Why is a line chart most always better than a scatter plot when visualizing time? Mm -hmm. So trends, trends, true, but it's mainly because time's continuous and it has an order to it. So the line, even though you may not have like millisecond resolution data, there is this idea that time is always like forward flowing arrow of time. And also there's an order to what the X axis is. Scatter plots don't explicitly encode order. Um, so that's one constraint that scatter plots loosen that make them not super well suited to, to dates, um, even though they can represent them. Um, what do bar charts do that scatter plots and line charts aren't good at? Comparisons with what? Say that loud a little. Uh, yes. So bar charts are good with categorical data. What do they do for us in this case? Nope. What is much easier to see in this chart rather than this chart? Mm -hmm. So. Scatter plot that's not actually in, um, and it's really even like a good just first pass to see and explore your data. So bar charts and histograms are good for exploring data. Bar charts are good because you can visually see missing data. Um, histograms are good because you can see nuances in your distribution. And why are scatter plots? Or why combine circles and a scatter plot with a line chart, as in this case? Mm -hmm. So for this, since the data is actually at pretty coarse resolution, it's every month, the scatter plot helps, in this case, to actually show how much and where exactly the data was measured along this trend. So um, this is kind of a what I, I, I like to say is like a nice addition to a line chart to combine the best of a bar chart with the best of a line chart is you put circles on it. So now we can a little bit probably see the missing data better, but we also see the trend and we get a sense that it's actually time. 
So if I remove the labels on the x-axis, we would probably still be able to discern that this is, is um, some time based on everything else. Um, in this bar chart, I'm actually going to remove the ticks. So you can sum it up, but you actually um, you need to do that outside of D3 specific things. So D3 isn't going to sum it up for you since it's pretty, again, low level. What you think the data structures you think in, in, in D3 are like bars, the idea of bars, not the idea of having the bar represent a sum. Um, but it does have functionality to actually do that aggregation. You just have to do it in addition to the bars. All right. So with this, maybe the x-axis isn't actually time. It's hard to tell with bars. Um, if there's no axis, even with the title median rent, who knows what this is a median rent over. Maybe it's a median rent over types of houses. Maybe it's like number of bedrooms or something. Um, but you can imagine that there's certain things in the chart type itself that encode certain types of information better than others. Um, and I'm going to leave this off and see and show you how as we transform this into a line chart and then add circles to it, it's going to make it a little bit better. Um, questions so far? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so the SVG G tag is the SVG equivalent of a div. It's a element that has no visual representation, but is purely used to group. Um, so what you, the, the pattern you often see in D3 is append G, and then we change the class to actually be chart. So now every bar inside of this G group element we can use D3 selectors referencing chart. So if we have multiple things on our, or multiple charts on our page, we want to be able to encapsulate all of the rectangles of chart one distinctly from all of the rectangles of chart two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most everything that gets put into a pen is a name of a tag. So I can't just put like a variable name into dot append. If I say like append John string, um, it's not a tag name, so it's going to throw some error. But I mean, we can do append circle and give it a class, but we're going to be putting rectangles in whatever. Um, so we can. We want to get more uh, specific in here. We can first select the chart and then select all of the bars inside of it. So this is the, the common thing that, that's often used uh, with the, the G tag. Is that make sense-ish? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I guess so. So this is how you can use it. We're not going to get to multiple charts on a page until a little bit later in the class, but we definitely will use G a lot when we get to putting like three charts on the page. Oh, um, transform is an SVG attribute that lets you apply some sort of function to the actual object. It's a little bit awkward to do in D3 since translate is an SVG function, but you have to specify it as a string. So what this actually looks like in the code um, makes more sense. Um, so if we look at the elements, if we actually look at the G, so inside of our SVG, we have this group. So this is a good example. So notice when I hover over SVG, it shows this whole area highlighted. And then the group basically shows only the chart. So the margins are the difference between the SVG and the group. And the group in here actually has this transform attribute. So it has a class of chart, and then it has transform attribute, which is an SVG specific thing that actually runs this SVG function translate. And all translate does is it moves the coordinate space of the object. So if you imagine this is our SVG, And um, let's say we initially start with the chart starting here. So we have like our chart basically in line with the top left corner. What translate does is it first moves it in 75 pixels in the X direction. And then it moves it, uh, yes. So it starts at the origin, it moves at 75 in the X, and then it moves 25 in the Y. And that's the new origin for that object. So I keep saying origin because in the SVG coordinate system, it's all shifts relative to this like starting point. So this actually moves the origin itself. So now every time we actually reference the chart, we're actually referencing basically a new thing here. So it's basically this like shifted SVG object. Uh, which is, the way to basically set an X and Y for the SVG or the G element. Yeah, it's, it's like a long winded way to set the X and Y starting of the G tag. All right, so the data, we may not be comfortable with the data bind, but we will get comfortable and it looks exactly the same as what we saw last time. So this is something we'll, we'll pull apart as we go through the course, but for now, we don't need to do anything new with data. Um, the new things here that again are kind of boilerplate are actually setting up the scales with functions to find the min and max for us. So last time we basically did the min and max, we hard coded it by eyeballing our data. That's not feasible when we have more than a handful of data points. So D3 gives us functionality to actually find the min, the max, and both at the same time. Um, time extent is, or actually D3.extent is a function that gives you the min and the max as an array. Um, so this actually returns something that looks like um, two date objects. Oh, I guess, no, so extent works for anything, um, but. Is it, is it based on the H dot HTTP caught up up there intentionally? It is intentional, but it's not important. Um, so white space in JavaScript, unlike in Python, 
I guess I should have mentioned this, is irrelevant. So white space in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript doesn't have any effect. Um, so we could just as easily write it like this, which looks kind of gross, but it works. We can also write it like this, strangely. I think this might work with like a whole new line. Um, you do need to put semicolons at the end. Um, I actually didn't have one there and it still worked. So the browser is very forgiving. It tries to close tags that aren't closed and it tries to add semicolons to JavaScript where it thinks they should go. But sometimes it gets it wrong. Um, like if you had a space here, I think it would actually try to insert a semicolon for you and that would throw an error. But um, style goes a long way, especially as you get really big JavaScript files. Um, yeah, so extent actually works with any data types. And just like with our accessor functions, whatever we return from this callback, so this is like a common D3 theme, whatever functions we're using, most of the time they take a callback function. And that callback function is a way to tell the D3 function what we care about. So in this case, we care about the min and max of the date. So we return a parsed date attribute. So in this case, D corresponds to every individual data point. This does this internal iteration over every data point. We want to find the min and the max of the month. So we're going to do the date. But if we wanted to find the min and the max of, let's say, another field that might be called, let's just say rent, we would say return the rent column of our data. I don't actually have one called rent, but whatever field or value you return is what gets computed as the min and the max. Um, if we don't want both the min and the max, we can use just the max function. We can use just the min function. And with this return value, we can then automatically set the domains for our x and our y scales. So extents and, and max are convenient for figuring out what domain we're going to use in our, in our scales. Um, and then we can use these scales to actually create the axes. So this all kind of is just really verbose. The only thing that we actually need to change if we use new data. So part of part one, hopefully part one will make you feel and understand how much boilerplate D3 has. Um, you only need to really change this line and this line. And the chart should work with a totally different data set from the scale perspective. Um, you might need to actually change how the times actually formatted. Maybe you don't have time on your x-axis and, and you'll just get rid of it all together. Um, to actually create the SVG like physical tick marks or visual tick marks, um, you use D3 axes. So D3.svg.axes to tell it what you actually want as the numbers on your axes. You just give it the scale and it figures out how to draw the tick marks. Um, again, a lot of this is uninteresting boilerplate um, that if you are interested in the details of it and how to customize it, um, definitely um, after class or in office hours, come, come talk to me and we can get deep in it, but I don't, I don't wanna get too distracted with that. Um, so this is one example of where you might want to customize it, add a separate, more custom label that might be responsive. So as they um, increase and decrease the size of the chart, we can actually dynamically redraw the chart. These are a little bit more advanced things, centering labels. Um, and then here is D3, uh, select all bar. And this is kind of 
what makes the chart the chart. This is where the bars come from. So I have all other 150 lines of code were just setting up axes basically. And then this draws bars. So um, the interesting things here are, are these X and these Ys. I'm going to turn these into circles because that's initially going to be easier than the lines. Um, so what do we need to change to get circles first um, before the lines? I guess in this code, what needs to change to get circles rather than bars? Mm -hmm. So circle, um, other, what else do we need to do? Uh, it's, what, what did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all of you seem to have said the right thing, but um, um, difference between bars and circles. Circles have CX and CY rather than just X and Y. They also don't have height and width. They um, just have radius. We actually have constant radius. So in this, we can just change the radius to be, let's say five. Let's move that down. We don't have height. And is that it? Any other things we need to do besides those like three changes? So they still have class bar. So this is a CSS selector class name. So this actually doesn't need to correspond to what the actual SVG tag itself is. Um, usually we would change this to be something that's more representative, but I want to show here that you don't have to name your circles with circle class and it still works. Let's see. We refresh the page. Nothing showing. We have a single object. Uh, those are our margins. Um, oh. <laughs> So it's not radius, it's just R, which uh, <laughs> Oh, it is. Uh, let's see, we don't need bar padding. I imagine there's one tiny thing I forgot. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, so it was this, uh, I forgot that when I was going through the live code, I actually added another select. Um, so here we have our circles um, representing Bernal Heights median rent. Is this better? Did it, are we happy with this? Were the bars better or the circles? Neither. Neither. Um, the thing we can't do here, it's really hard to actually see missing data or to understand that it is discrete data. 
since there's no axis, but even with the axis, it's going to be really hard to understand that it's discrete, uh, like months. So it like kind of helps us with the axis, but it's still really hard to know that these are like one measurement per month. Um, and we are just out of time. Um, but um, yeah, I guess the, the line isn't, isn't super important. I just wanted to show conversion from one to the other. Um, it will be left as an exercise to the reader or to actually just look at this. And there's just one extra um, line of code to draw the line. Um, Yeah, so this is the only thing we really need to do for the line. There's just these like two two lines of code. Um, there's a there's a little difference in syntax, but the ideas of what we did with the circles feels almost identical. Um, and then the last part of the legend. Um, I'm not going to talk through the legend code, but um, given that here's an example legend, can anyone think of how to programmatically make this legend with D3? What, what are the like visual elements that make up this legend? Squares in SVG speak? Rex. So rectangles are more general than squares. So you can always make a square from a rectangle um, and other, other elements. Text, colors. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, ch -ch -ch. so this example is actually linked to in the project. Um, I'll also throw in this, this other good block of um, various color scales illustrated. Um, to do colors or any real categorical scale, the only thing we need to change, we still do domains and scales and all that. We just need to change, instead of d3.scale linear, d3.scale category 10. Um, and then to do the, the legend itself, again, you just append rectangles and you put text next to them. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the whirlwind chart tour. Um, I'll be hanging around after uh, for maybe a half hour or an hour for like another impromptu office hours. Um, project due at the beginning of class on Thursday. Um, so again, this is the, um, the private gist. So as I go through my, uh, my method of grading, um, I'm gonna go through here. I'm gonna view all your forks from the first one. And for the um, private gist, you can either, probably the best is to send me a private message on Piazza or post it in the Canvas link. The best actually is to post it in the Canvas submission, but if the Canvas submission is doing strange things, I haven't seen from what it looks like on the student side, the uh, Canvas should have a, um, a submit URL box for the project one assignment. Um, if, if that's not working, just send me like a private message on Piazza with the link and I'll figure out how to merge all the submissions. Um, and I'll just be visualizing them on blocks. So if it doesn't work on blocks, um, I'll still like tweak it to actually see something visually. But as, as a way to um, test it, you can always use blocks actually for private gists. So you're not gonna be able to find your private gist on blocks. But if you are already at a private gist, 
Like if you're already at this page on your private gist, you can just change this to be like bl.ocks.org. And then it'll show it privately only to you. Um, so, so please just like make sure that that works. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you get like a zero or anything, but um, that'll make my life a lot easier and make me get you um, grades back faster. I'm also going to, with project one, also grade all of the other things. I'm sorry, there's been a little of a backlog on getting feedback back to you, but um, office hours and email and Piazza are the best ways to like really bug and bother me if you have questions or concerns or want feedback or want answers. Um, those are the, the, the best places. Um, and anything that comes up between now and then, try posting on Piazza. I'll have office hours right before lab tomorrow or on Thursday, but um, hopefully there's not like a whole class of people there who are like, project doesn't work, I need help. Um, because if that happens, very few of you will get the help. So I guess don't really like anticipate having an hour of me to only you if you need it on Thursday. There's probably going to be a fair amount of people, and I'll do my best to help all of them. Um, the... I guess who here feels right now that they have enough familiarity with D3 to do part two of the project? Who here has done part two of the project? All right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, for this one, since since D3 is is not your typical library, um, this time, one time only, let's say due on Monday. Um, so due on Monday, we'll do more again of this in, in the lab. I'll send the sections out tonight on Piazza again, um, or if it's easy, yeah, let's just do this is section one, the left side of the U, the right side of the U is section two for discussion. Um, section one, all of you. For Thursday, it'll be three, two, four, or no, what? One, two to three thirty. All right, two to three thirty lab, three thirty to five lab for Thursday, and then one to two is lecture. Everyone good, happy, and I think that's all. Sorry, things went five-ish minutes over, um, ten-ish, but I've been seeing some good progress. People have got charts. People have shown me. We'll get to do some cool, fun, interactive, complex maps and whatnot. Oh, mm -hmm. so note about secret gists. So secret gists are, I guess, hidden, but they're not private or secure. So you can't search on GitHub to find them. You can't search on blocks to find them. But if you have that hash, like in theory, someone could stumble upon your hash. But yeah, for all practical purposes, uh, usually it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll post, I'll post the videos and the code tonight. 
So like, hopefully the videos will be good if you want to go back and then like rewatch portions of the lecture.